Okay, the time here in the Eastern Time Zone is 1 o'clock, so it is, begin, it is time for us to begin our presentation today on solving the Wireless LAN hardware puzzle. So I've decided to start doing something when I deliver these webinars, and that is that I will be kind of letting you know where this webinar fits in the certification arena with CWNP. So we have, of course, our CWTS and CWNA certifications. Uh, we have our professional levels, CWSP, CWAP, and CWDP. And uh, then, of course, we have the CWNE. So if you think of your CWTS and CWNA kind of like a 101 level, and your CWSP, AP, and DP is kind of like a 201 level, and then CWNE is a 301 level, this would be a 101 webinar. And so we're looking at some of the basics of wireless technology. We like to do more advanced things, looking at protocol analysis and dealing with design issues like coverage and capacity and these kinds of things. And those are very important, but it's also important to remember that a large group of people need to learn the basics as well. And so we'll be focusing on some of the basics of wireless LAN hardware and some of the things that we need to consider along the way. And I'll be putting in some extra little tidbits of knowledge that may be a little above a 101 level as we go along, but that'll kind of let you know where this webinar fits in the grand scheme of things. So as we talk about solving the wireless LAN hardware puzzle, there are really two angles we have to take. One is the RF hardware and the other is the wired hardware and services. Uh, we might say the supporting hardware and services, and then the actual RF hardware itself, the hardware that has the ability to transmit and receive radio frequency signals. So that's what we'll be looking at today. My name is Tom Carpenter, and I'm the CTO here at CWNP, and I'll be your presenter today as we go through this information. Now, before we get into uh, too much depth on the specifics of the wireless LAN hardware puzzle, just a quick review of the certifications that we do offer here at CWNP. I've just mentioned that we have CWTS, which is not pictured here. CWTS is a, a bit easier uh, to prepare for as a certification than CWNA, uh, but it's a good place to start for people that are completely new to wireless or for people that want to get a certification related to help desk support, sales support, and these kinds of things in the Wi-Fi space. CWNA goes uh, more broad and into more depth than CWTS. And the big focus of CWNA is on radio frequency fundamentals and understanding the hardware components that are involved in building a wireless network. And then, of course, some of the basics of security design and analysis, though not in extensive depth at, uh, depth at the CWNA level. Then you have the professional level certifications, all of them ending with P, CWSP, CWDP, and CWAP. So the S in CWSP is for security. The focus there is on making sure that we implement our wireless networks in a secure manner and we understand the security risks to our wireless networks. The D in CWDP is for design and the focus is on both designing and planning and implementing a successful wireless network. CWAP, the A is for analysis, and the focus here is on troubleshooting, being able to understand how to resolve issues when they come up in our wireless network. Of course, the elite ultimate expert level is the CWNE. This is an individual who has passed all four of the CWNA, CWSP, CWDP, and CWAP exams, worked in the industry for three plus years, and then submits an application, which is then processed by the CWNE Board of Advisors, who are themselves six CWNEs. They look at the application and determine if it meets the qualifications and if that person ought to be awarded the status of CWNE. We have over 180 that have received that status up to this point and it's growing uh, much more quickly now than in the past. We expect to reach 200 or better by the end of this year at the rate we're going now. You can learn more about all of our certifications anytime by going to CWNP.com and clicking on the certifications option in the menus. Now, one final bit of news, we do have our conference coming up now just a couple of weeks away in New Orleans. We'll be uh, meeting there in New Orleans for Wi-Fi Trek 2016, and it'll be the 28th through the 30th. Our pre-conference training classes are sold out at this point, so the conference is still wide open for you to register. You want to make sure you get there if you can in order to be able to network with your peers, learn some new information about Wi-Fi. We always get some of the latest and greatest in our presentations, and you can find out more about that at cwnp.com forward slash NOLA. All right, with that, let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing when we're talking about the wireless LAN hardware puzzle, 
would be the RF devices. So as I said, RF devices use radios to transmit or receive radio frequency waves with information modulated for communications. These are what we might call RF devices. Now 802.11 RF devices of course use radio frequency waves in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequency band. Some of them at 60 gigahertz, some of them at 900 megahertz, not as many of those yet. And they are modulated based on the physical layer specifications defined in the 802.11 standard. These devices then are going to include your laptops and tablets and this would be your client devices, your access points of course, and also your support devices. So we're going to talk about all three here as far as the perspective of RF devices goes. So first of all we have the access points. Now an access point is really just a computer with memory, processors, specialty components like radios and filters for RF processing and to form the center of a wireless network or more specifically of a BSS in a wireless network. Now access points then are going to have a circuit board inside of them with different chips on them and chip sets for wireless communications. They're going to have Ethernet ports at least one, sometimes two or more. They're going to have memory in order to be able to handle and store all of the data that they're managing such as all of the client associations and the information about those, buffered frames for the clients and so forth. So all of this is going to be managed through a circuit board that's inside of the access point. And right here we're actually looking at just one example access point. This is the Cisco 3800 series AP and we see uh, courtesy of the FCC ID search on this access point. We can see the external view of the AP with a ruler to show you the relative size of that AP. We can also see the inside photo of the circuit board that was taken by the FCC as well. So this is a great tip for you. We've talked about it in other webinars. We talk about it in our study guides and in blogs at our website and in videos on the CWNP TV YouTube channel. You can use the FCC ID search in order to find out what's inside of your wireless devices without having to take them apart yourself and risk possibly damaging them or voiding the warranty. So the FCC has already taken it apart. If that's good enough for you to just look at some pictures, then you can do that there. You'll see PDFs with these in it. Of course, sometimes it's just fun to take it apart yourself, but just keep in mind that if you do that, you could void the warranty from the vendor. And of course, we don't want to do that for any of our enterprise gear that we're using within our business space. This particular access point has two different Ethernet ports capable of one, two and a half or five gigabits per second depending on of course the standards you're using in the infrastructure and it also has one configurable radio and one five gigahertz radio. So it can have one of the radios be either 2.4 gigahertz or five gigahertz and the other is only five gigahertz. Therefore the AP can operate as dual band, a 2.4 gigahertz AP and a five gigahertz at the same time or it can run dual concurrent 5 gigahertz radios. Of course, some of the testing that's been done out in the industry at this point has shown that running two 5 gigahertz radios in the same AP, even when configuring lower 5 gigahertz channels and higher 5 gigahertz channels for the two APs, can cause some degradation in performance in that AP. So we've yet to see an AP release that has uh, the exact equivalent performance of what you'd get by implementing two different 5 gigahertz access points as opposed to two 5 gigahertz radios in one access point of the configuration that we have here where it's just a standard access point with two 5 gigahertz radios. So that's an important factor to keep in mind when you're making that kind of a decision. We do see here the external antenna connectors where the external antennas connect to the AP and these are standard dipole antennas that typically connect though Cisco does sell other kinds of antennas that can be connected to this access point. Then internally in the shot you can see the four MC connector types that we have here that are actually used to connect to the actual circuit board itself. So when you're looking at access points some of the features you need to think about include first of all band support and we just talked about that with the Cisco 3800 series and so what we're talking about is do they support 5 gigahertz and 2.4? Do they support dual band concurrent, 
do they support dual 5 gigahertz radios at the same time? So these are factors you have to consider when selecting an access point. The vast majority of enterprise grade access points are dual band and if they're an 11AC access point it means they'll support 802.11AC in 5 gigahertz and they'll support 802.11N in 2.4 gigahertz because 802.11AC is not really implemented in 2.4 gigahertz. So they'll have that kind of support available to them. Then we have channel widths and some of the APs support only up to a 40 megahertz channel because they're only 11N. Others that are 11AC may support up to 80 or even 160 megahertz depending on whether they're what we call wave one or wave two 802.11AC devices. Now it's important to keep in mind that in the 802.11 standard, there really isn't any such thing as wave one and wave two. What we have is required features and optional features. 802.11AC as an amendment to the 802.11 standard required 80 megahertz channels. 160 megahertz channels were optional. So that just gives you an example. So for the most part, what we see in wave one versus wave two is wave one implemented required features and wave two implemented the optional features that were to come. So if you have a wave two 11 AC device, you'll see features like 160 megahertz channels. You'll see multi-user MIMO support and things like that. But keep in mind, that was all defined in the original amendment. It's just that the chipsets didn't implement it initially so that they could come to market more quickly with just the required features. Now, when I say the channel widths can be up to 160 megahertz, please do not confuse that with me recommending 160 megahertz channels. I would never recommend the use of 160 megahertz channel in any deployment in an enterprise space. I wouldn't even recommend it in a consumer space myself. I just don't see any current scenario that justifies it. Now you might be able to come up with one that would justify an 80 megahertz channel. You might. But even that I think is a stretch for the vast majority of deployments. 20 and 40 megahertz channels are all we need for most of the deployments that we're doing today. Now another feature of an access point is MIMO and it's important to understand this in combination with antennas. So. MIMO is multiple input, multiple output, and it's the ability to transmit and receive multiple spatial streams. So for example, if I'm using a 20 megahertz channel with one spatial stream, I'm going to have a particular data rate, but if I use the same 20 megahertz channel with two or three or four spatial streams, I'm going to have higher data rates available to me. So we need to know when we're looking at an AP, what we can really do with that AP. For example, you might see an AP that has external antennas and you might see four antennas on the outside of that AP. And it's a dual band AP. So you might think that you can do say three by three by three in five or 2.4 gigahertz. But if you actually look at the specifications for the AP, you might find that 2.4 gigahertz only does two by two. And five gigahertz does three by three by three or maybe even four by four. So the point is that you need to look at the specifications sheet, the spec sheet for the access point to understand what it's doing with the antennas that it has. Some of those antennas may be used simply for diversity. They may not be used for both bands. That is, you may not actually have three antennas for both bands, you may only have it for one. So this is important to consider when looking at APs. And then when it comes to antennas, do they have support for internal only or do they also support external antennas? If you want to use a patch antenna system or something of that sort, you need support for external antennas. If you're fine with typical office coverage that we get from internal only APs, then that's going to be just fine to use those internal antennas. You also need to understand the propagation pattern expected from the antennas of the APs because that's going to help in your design process for understanding where you're going to need APs and how many you'll need. Now, an additional feature of an AP is its powering source. The vast majority of enterprise APs today can be powered by power over ethernet. So the ethernet cable that connects them to the network can also provide the power to them so that they can actually give the functionality that they offer. Monitoring is a feature of APs and this means the ability to look at the spectrum or to capture 802.11 packet information. And so many APs will support this. You'll need to understand how it works. You may very well have to take the radio offline to use these features, meaning it doesn't function as an AP anymore. And that obviously is going to be an important factor. 
And then finally, you have management options. So there are controller-based APs that are managed through controllers. There are lightweight APs that are managed individually. There are lightweight, a or rather autonomous APs that are managed individually. Autonomous APs that are managed through network management systems. There are also APs that are managed through cloud-based services. The point is you need to understand the options for management of those devices and make sure that they comply with your organizational policies and standards. For example, some organizations have policies that will not allow any network devices to be managed outside of the network. So for example, if I wanted to go with a company that was cloud managed, but they also provided an internal server to manage their devices, then in that case, I would need to go with the internal server to comply with my company policy. So you have to make sure you understand those things as well. And a big thing to keep in mind is that selecting an AP is driven by cost, features, and existing infrastructure. It's never just about the features. So we'd like to say that I can just pick the AP that does what I want the best way possible. But sometimes that AP is too expensive for my budget, and I really don't have the option of using that AP. So it is in the real world driven by cost as well as features and it's also driven by your existing infrastructure. If you would have to invest significantly in infrastructure upgrades to implement one AP over another, you may find yourself in a situation where you choose the one that's going to result in the least expensive upgrades. Now of course we also have our client devices. Uh, client devices include tablets and laptops and mobile phones, but there's more. We have Wi-Fi door locks, we have specialty healthcare devices, we have manufacturing devices and so forth that may connect to the Wi-Fi network and transmit information. So the factors with these devices is understanding the band support. Are they 2.4 gigahertz only, 5 gigahertz, maybe in the future 900 megahertz? What band do they support? What is the receive sensitivity of the devices? Knowing the receive sensitivity of the device is important because it tells you what signal strength you need to get particular data rates for that device in an area. And so it can really impact your cell sizes and things like that if you have significant numbers of devices that have bad receive sensitivity ratings. The EAP types is also important because it drives what you can use for security. If your client devices only support a limited number of EAP types, you'll have to choose from among those to implement your extensible authentication protocol. MIMO factors are key. Uh, you may have an AP that's four by four by four. That's fine. But are all of your clients two by two? Then you really don't ever use that four by four by four capability. Now you might use the multi-user MIMO capability of it, but you're not going to use the four spatial streams to transmit to one client. And this is why I say here that clients determine the real data rates used on the wireless LAN, regardless of AP capabilities. Now, obviously, the client can never do more than the AP can do. If I connect an 11N client to an 11G access point, I'm going to have to communicate as an 11G device. But if my AP is the latest and greatest of 802.11ac, but all of my clients are Wave 1, I'm not going to use those Wave 2 features. So the client determines, in the end, the real data rates used on the wireless LAN, and in addition, the signal strength that the client is able to receive or that the AP can receive from that client. All of this is going to determine the data rate. So it really ends up being left in the hands of the clients. If that makes you feel powerless, well, understand that with proper design, we can accommodate for some of the least common denominator clients that we have in our space to make sure that we're achieving as much as possible the data rates that we desire for the performance that we demand. Of course, power management is another feature of the client, and this is about how often they power down their radio and making sure that we support on the infrastructure the enablement of features that accommodate for the power management used in those client devices. Now, we also have support tools in this RF category. These are the tools that we use in order to troubleshoot, analyze, repair our wireless network and optimize performance of our wireless network and so forth. So we have tools ranging from simply Wi-Fi adapters that we can connect to our laptop and then once connected they work with special software like OmniPeak, Wi-Fi Analyzer Pro, ComView for Wi-Fi, etc. These are protocol analyzers that are capable of specific Wi-Fi analysis. So they give us special information about what's going on in the wireless network. And so those adapters are important. We see the Proxim adapter here, which has been used for a lot of years now with 11N capabilities. 
And we also have now 11AC adapters from uh, Netgear and others that also work with some of these protocol analyzers. And then some of the protocol analysis vendors provide their own custom adapters that work as well. In addition to Wi-Fi adapters, we also have spectrum analysis adapters. Probably the two most commonly used today are Wi-Spy DBX from MetaGeek and the Spectrum XT air magnet spectrum adapter from uh, Fluke Networks, now NetScout. And so these adapters uh, connect through USB and then work with spectrum analysis software. So for example, Wi-Spy DBX works with Channelizer and the air magnet spectrum adapter works with air magnet spectrum XT. They are support tools that listen to RF. They don't really transmit anything. They listen to the RF, but they're looking at it from a signal perspective and an RF waveform perspective and not so much from 802.11 perspective. Uh, for example, with YSPY DBX and Channelizer, if you want to see the 802.11 information in addition to the YSPY DBX, you have to enable your 802.11 adapter to get that information in the tool. With the air magnet spectrum adapter, if you want to get Wi-Fi information as well, you'll need an adapter that Spectrum XT supports as well to gather the Wi-Fi information. So the, the Wi-Fi integration capabilities come from the Wi-Fi adapter. The spectrum information comes from the spectrum adapter. And so when we're talking about spectrum information, we're talking about the RF energy in the space, which can include intentional and unintentional radiated energy. And then we have devices like the NetScout AirCheck G2 shown here, which is a handheld device that allows you to quickly gather information about the wireless networks that are seen. It does also have an Ethernet test built in that can report on PoE and Ethernet line speeds and the accessibility of various services on the network, which can be important for troubleshooting as well. You can see, for example, how many APs are shown on a given channel, so you can begin to analyze uh, CCI problems that might exist for co-channel interference. You can look at specific access points, specific clients, see their signal strength, and other such information. Uh, all of this can be captured in screenshots and also saved as reports that can be sent back to the software on a PC to which you connect the NetScout with a USB cable. So these are very powerful capabilities that uh, this tool provides for troubleshooting as well. Ultimately, the big thing to remember is that professionals use professional tools. Wireless LAN professionals should have these tools if they desire success. So you don't want to just try to walk around with something like Insider on a laptop and that's the only tool you have. Hey, that might be good as a first glance just to see what's in the space. But when it's time to do the heavy duty analysis, you need the protocol analyzers, the spectrum analyzers, and tools like the NetScout AirCheck G2. They're going to help you get the real information you need to troubleshoot and analyze a wireless network. Now we also have, in addition to the RF side, we have the wired hardware and services that are important. And this section will be a little quicker as we go through this information. So we're going to have our switches and routers, our controllers, and then the services on the network. So the infrastructure, controllers, and network services are often the real problem when users indicate a Wi-Fi problem. So it's not uncommon for users to say, hey, the wireless network is down. Or often they just say the wireless internet is down, as if the whole internet has now become magically wireless and there aren't any wires there anymore. Of course, we understand what they mean. The reality is, though, that when they say the Wi-Fi is down, a lot of times your internet connection is down. It has nothing to do with Wi-Fi. Or they say Wi-Fi is down, the DHCP pool is depleted. It has nothing to do with Wi-Fi. And so all of these other services and servers and, and hardware devices are important as well. So when it comes to your infrastructure hardware, you're dealing with primarily switches and routers. And with the switches, it's important to make sure that they provide the PoE that's required. So your access points may need to be powered by PoE. And if you're providing that from the switch and not from a PoE injector, you need to make sure they're providing the required PoE. You need to make sure that the power budget is available in the switch, meaning that each switch has a total pool of power they can provide. So let's say it's 300 watts. Well, if 300 watts of power can be provided and you've got 10 APs that need 30 watts, we'll say, to make our math easy, then obviously you can handle that. But now the 11th AP, it's either not going to work or it's going to work with lower capabilities if you switch several of the ports to lower 
output power settings. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. If you're powering APs with PoE and they say, well, they'll support, uh, say, 12.95 watts instead of 25.5 watts, yes, they might, but if they do that, are you losing some features? Is it turning off an entire radio? So what is it changing about how the AP works? That's important to consider. Another thing in our switches, we need to make sure quality of service is enabled in the switch. Uh, this would be ethernet level quality of service, right? And then the line speeds need to be there, usually gigabit today to the access point as a minimum. And then they'll have to have the VLANs configured for the different SSIDs that you're going to provide through the APs. And they may need trunking for some APs. They may use access ports for some APs. It's going to depend on the AP configuration, so you have to look at your AP vendor documentation for that. When it comes to the routers, we've got layer three quality of service. We need to make sure is implemented appropriately. Uh, IP routing, obviously, access control list filtering, these kinds of things. Still, the line speeds need to be at one gigabit or greater. And then potentially service provisioning. So in some environments, the routers are used to provide DHCP to all of the clients. So we need to make sure that's capable. They may, at the very least, provide DHCP forwarding or relay capabilities. So we need to make sure the proper services are there. In the end, switches and routers should be carefully inspected for QoS support when implementing real-time wireless solutions because we can implement QoS in the AP and the client can support it, the voice over IP Wi-Fi client, and that's great for the wireless link, but that doesn't necessarily do anything for the rest of the traversal of the network. We have to make sure the switches and routers end-to-end -end are configured to support quality of service. And then finally, again, as I've said, we have the services that have to be there. So this may be a hardware or software issue. I mean, they're running on hardware somewhere, right? So even if I'm using DHCP on Windows servers, as an example, well, that's a Windows server. The server is a piece of hardware. Even if it's a virtual server, it's still running on a server that's running the virtualization engine. So ultimately, there's always hardware there. And the services, of course, for wireless include things like DHCP, DHCP is, of course, used for the clients, but it's also used for APs. Uh, it may provide to the APs the IP address of the wireless line controller. The domain name system, there's a typo in my slide here. It should be DNS, not DSN. And the domain name system, of course, for name resolution for the clients, but again, also may be used by the APs to locate the controller based on a host name specified by the vendor. The network time protocol, or NTP, is used to keep the time synchronized among the different devices. Uh, remote authentication dial-in user service, or RADIUS, may be used as an authentication server by the wireless clients for extensible authentication protocol, or EAP authentication. And then a network directory service, like Active Directory, may be needed. You may need FTP or TFTP servers. This is not uncommon for firmware updates, for example, particularly with autonomous APs, where we might put the firmware on a TFTP server and then install it on the APs. And of course, internet connectivity is pretty well essential to our wireless networks today. So these are all key factors as far as the services that need to be available. And you have to make sure that you're provisioning for these services. In addition, if you're using an EAP type that actually requires certificates on the client, you'll probably have to implement a public key infrastructure internally just to handle all of those certificates. If a certificate is only required on the RADIUS server, then you may be able to get by with not having an internal PKI. But when dealing with the hundreds of clients that you're probably supporting with something like EAP TLS, then you'll need to consider the impact of implementing a public key infrastructure, which means implementing one or more certificate authorities in your environment to create and distribute and manage the life cycle of certificates. So the key here is that services must be available for wireless line clients just as they are for wired clients. Service failure simply equals network failure to users. And our final little tweet this of the day is simply this, getting the right hardware is important for wireless LAN network success. So this webinar has been an introduction to the different parts and pieces that make up a wireless network. And I would encourage you to explore this further. You can do it through our uh, CWNP study guides, through our CWNA study guides, CWNA e-learning, CWTS study guide, CWTS e-learning. All of these would be good resources to go further if you're newer to wireless networking and you want to learn more about these topics. As we begin to wrap up the presentation today, just a final reminder of the conference that is coming up here in just a couple of weeks in New Orleans, and the URL is provided here for access to that.